Hello, New York City. Forward together. It's good to be here. We thank God for the privilege of being here. And we recognize that you allowed a little country boy to come up here to the city. <laughs> Let's thank the good people at Auburn for allowing this opportunity. <laughs> President and all of the officers. How many, any Moral Monday attendees are in the room? Been down to North Carolina, this way. Any arrestees, stand up, any arrestees other than Yara? All right, well, I just, I, I, oh, there's one, there's one. Blame everything I say on Brother Mackey. He came down and harassed me for three hours. About the most convincing fellow I ever met in my life. <laughs> Made me think I could almost do anything. Give it up for Brother Mackey. Actually, forward together, not one step back, is a phrase that uh, came about because of Rob Stevens. Uh, he helped put that together. He's now here at Union. Rob, wave your hand. And Brother Wesley is here at Union. Uh, so Mara Monday has sent you two new seminarians, and they are going to be a powerhouse as they're making their way through seminary here. Now, long before anybody knew about the Forward Together Mara movement, it actually is eight years old. It's not just one year old. Uh, Patricia Gerardo, when we were volunteering and just doing what we did, because we've never gone to somebody and said, if you give us something, then we will do. We believed that if we started trying, somebody would help. It's kind of like the way Mary McLeod Bethune built Bethune Cookman. She just went on the garbage dump and started cleaning her. And folks said, well, what are you doing, old lady? She says, I'm building a college. And so some people said, you better help her because she's crazy. She's not going to stop. And then some said, you better help her because she's inspiring. But whatever the reason, they helped us. Well, long before we had no staff, I mean, literally none. I'm a volunteer, by the way. Uh, all state presidents are and local presidents. Uh, Patricia Gerardo with OSI uh, heard about us and helped us to receive some money so we could at least have a couple of staff people uh, that could work on this work. I didn't know she was going to be here tonight, but I want to thank her. Thank her for for seeing and believing when other folk doubt it. Now, for me, this is Tuesday night midweek service. So I was told I was invited here to preach tonight. Uh, and so in my tradition, when you come to another place, let's thank, where's the pastor? Let's thank God for the pastor of this church. Where is she? There is she is. Great, a great leader in her own right. I could just feel her spirit when I walked into her study. And so tonight I want to uh, start where I would always start, and that is with the Word of God from the Message Bible. How y'all like Miss Yara Allen, by the way? She is, she and her sisters, her sister are like the Mahalias of our movement. Uh, they are not just merely singers, they are theomusicologists who can teach as well as sing as well as do many other forms of, of the arts because you cannot have a movement without embracing the arts. In the book of Ezekiel, in the Message Bible, you will find these words in the 22nd chapter, beginning at the 23rd verse. God's message came to me, son of man, tell Jerusalem, that your land, you're a land that during the time I was angry with you, got no rain, not so much as spring, a spring shower. The leaders among you became desperate, like roaring, ravaging lions, killing indiscriminately. They grabbed and looted, leaving widows in their wake. Your priest violated my law and desecrated my holy things, for they lost the ability to tell the difference between the sacred and the secular. They began to tell the people there is no difference between right and wrong. 
They are contemptuous of my holy Sabbath. They profane me by trying to pull me down to their level. Because of that, your politicians are like wolves, prowling and killing like those infected with rabies, taking whatever they want. Your preachers and your priests cover up for the politicians by pretending to have received visions and special revelations. They say, this is what God the master says when God hasn't said so much as one word because God does not endorse injustice. Extortion is rife, robbery is epidemic, the poor and the needy are abused, the immigrants and outsiders are kicked around at will with no access to justice. So I looked for someone to stand up for me against all of this injustice to repair the defenses of the city. I looked for someone to take a stand for me, to stand in the gap, to protect the land so that I wouldn't have to destroy it. And I could not find anyone, no, not one. The question tonight, is there anyone that will stand in the gap and trust God for transformation? It's the question I want you to ask your neighbor. Say, neighbor, is there anyone who will stand in the gap and trust God for transformation? You know, on this Moral Monday movement, as it is spreading throughout the land, I've been invited, Yara and I and others, to do training. We don't go to lead Moral Monday in other areas. We go to share what we've learned because we believe movements have to be indigenously led and build from the bottom up, not <clears throat> from the top down. But on this trek, I've had some powerful experiences. And one of them, unlike uh, like coming here to New York, I had the opportunity to go to Milwaukee, Wisconsin a city that was known as the Selma of the North. And I went there for the beginning of the Wisconsin Moral Monday movement. You know, there was the Wisconsin uprising, but they called and said that, is, that uprising was so one issue focused that they needed a broader focus, a deeper agenda, and a way to build and sustain long-term moral dissent. So we went there to be a blessing, but while there, I was blessed, for I met Margaret Rosga, the widow of a former priest named Father Grope, or Grape. She wrote a bio entitled 200 Nights in One Day, you ought to read it sometime, which tells the story through poetry of the strength, commitment, and passion of the people, mostly young, who marched for the right of the poor and black people under the leadership of Father Grappe. In the foreword, Dick Gregory says that Father Grappe was an Italian brother, soul brother, <laughs> raised in Milwaukee to a middle-class family who could not accept housing discrimination, segregation of schools, and the wrongs of government perpetrated on the lives of everyday poor people. James Grappe was his name, was born in the Bayview neighborhood on the south side of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to Italian immigrant parents. Year after graduation, he went to Mount Calvary Seminary. And according to Frank Ockfra, it was during his seminary years that Father Grappe, during his seminary year, during his seminary year, <laughs> that Father Grope began developing an empathy with the poor and with African Americans. Let me just say as a side, if during your seminary years, nothing happens during your seminary years <laughs> that enables you to develop empathy for the poor and the black, you are not at a seminary. <laughs> he worked 
during the summers at a youth center in Milwaukee's inner core. It was there that he saw the social sufferings and ostracism that Negroes, as the word would say then, lived with every day. Grappi was ordained to the Roman Catholic priesthood and after studying at St. Francis Seminary, he was assigned to St. Veronica's Church in Milwaukee. In 1963, Grappi was transferred to St. Boniface, the latter parish having a predominantly African-American congregation fusion politics. An Italian soul brother born to immigrant families now pastoring an inner city parish uh, in Milwaukee. It was then that Grappi became interested and active in the cause of civil rights for African Americans and for others. He participated in the 1963 March on Washington and the Selma to Montgomery marches. He was there even when the higher ups in the Catholic Church uh, said that the nuns and priests should not go. I don't know if you know that story, but it has been said that there was a suggestion they should not go, and a group of nuns and priests said, but because of the Kairos moment that we're in, Dr. King is our pope today. <laughs> and we'll be in Montgomery. He worked for on behalf of the voting rights. He worked with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in 1965, he returned to Milwaukee, becoming the advisor, this is fusion politics, to the Milwaukee chapter of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, of which I know all of you in this room are a member of. <clears throat> um, and he became an advisor of the Youth Council, organizing protest against segregation, not in Selma, Montgomery, or Birmingham, Alabama, I mean, Sel yeah, Selma, Alabama, or Montgomery, Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama, but protests against segregation in 1965 in Milwaukee Public School. Nine years after Brown. Could I say this lovingly to my northern friends? <laughs> Don't y'all ever get too, you know, boastful about what y'all, how y'all are not like the South. <laughs> Don't y'all look down like there's some ignorant folk in the South that are racist. There's some ignorant folk up here that are racist. In fact, the first riot after the Brown decision was not in the South. It was right here in New York. The first riot saying we cannot integrate public schools did not happen in the South. And the person that led the fight, uh, the call for the impeachment of Eisenhower and the impeachment of Char uh, Chief Justice Warren was Freddie Koch. Not down in the South. Freddie Koch, who led the John Birch Society. So we need to understand racism does not stay below the Mason-Dixon line. Lord, help us here. Let me rush on here. <laughs> So in 1965, nine years after Brown, they were still struggling with integration in Milwaukee. And Father Grappi got involved leading the youth council of the NAACP. Now in his, in his advisory capacity, he organized an all black male group called the Milwaukee Commandos. I'm going somewhere with this. They were formed to help quell violence during the freedom marches and with the NAACP Youth Council, they mounted a continuous demonstration against the city of Milwaukee. Not one demonstration, but 200 nights they marched. Nights. Because the city had put in a curfew that said at night you can't walk across this particular bridge because it was the separation between the white and black community. And he led these fair housing marches across what was called the 16th Street Viqueduct. It was a half mile gap, a half mile valley that was considered to be the symbolic divide for the city. It was a gap and in 1968, that demonstration after King was dead, won the passage of a fair housing ordinance. King was dead. Malcolm was dead, Mega was dead, Viola Russa was dead, 
Four girls were dead. But Father Groppy chose not to be fall into depression. On September 29, 1969, a year after Dr. King's death, he organized and led the Welfare Mothers March on Madison during which over a thousand welfare mothers marched into the Wisconsin State Assembly Chamber. They did not go have a seminar on what was wrong <laughs> or engage in another lengthy session where we put those little green, blue, and red dots up on the <laughs> top of the wall to try to figure out what the agenda's gonna be. Y'all laughing because y'all sick of it too. <laughs> but they marched in the Wisconsin State Ch Assembly Chamber and had their convention there, seized it in protest against planned welfare cuts. And Groppy and his supporters held the State Assembly Chamber in a sit-down strike for 11 hours before police could recover the chamber. He was cited in a bill of attainder for contempt of the state assembly and sentenced to six months in jail because he chose to stand in the gap with poor welfare mothers. Grappi appealed to the federal courts, which quickly reversed his conviction, and the U.S. Supreme Court invalidated the contempt citation. He led young people as a priest, as a pastor, as a preacher through the gap the 16th Street Viaqueduct and chose to stand in the place that represented the divide of the city. Father Grappi understood then what we must understand now, that we have to somehow answer the question God raised with Ezekiel. Is there someone who will stand in the gap? for me. You know, the book of Ezekiel is the third of the major prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah, and the name literally means Ezekiel, E-L, God, God, Ezekiel, strength, God strengthens. And Walter Brueggemann gives one of the best overviews of the text, a historical analysis. He says, if you want to understand Ezekiel 22, you have to start here by understanding, you know, how you study scripture in seminary, you don't start with the scripture, you start with the context, the history around the scripture because the scripture is set into a contextual place. So Brueggemann says you got to look at what was going on. The government in ancient Jerusalem was busy, busy doing what governments do, deploying ambassadors, developing new weapon systems, designing new technologies, dealing with cost overruns, cutting taxes for the wealthy, raising taxes on the poor, levying taxes, holding press conference, and as one songwriter said, lying to the masses. That's what governments do. <laughs> the government was busy pursuing the things that they thought would bring security, or at least an impression of security. We're gonna have security, we gotta have power, and money, and technology. But Ezekiel said the more it worked on security and defense, the more precarious public life became. And then the government did what government sometimes do. Instead of being honest and truly looking at its moral failing, the government held press conferences to give assurances that everything is all right. And then to take the people's mind off the inner moral failure, the, governor, the government began to engage in war games. And it showed the flag, says Brueggemann, and it re reiterated the slogans and, 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 and received innocent applause. All of these activities, however, had an empty ring. Now, the commentator goes on to say, with the, with, while its leaders engaged in war and press conferences and waving the flag, and not dealing with the real struggles of the least of these in its midst, Jerusalem was staggering toward death, was opening itself to be invaded by another empire because it was spending its life in self-deception, which always leads to self-destruction. Because all the technology, power, and money cannot bring safety and peace ultimately. Most of the people in Jerusalem had not noticed what was really going on but some had. 
Now, they were called by some cranks. Strange nuisances. There was one named Jeremiah who, who, who reprimanded the, 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 the way of things and spoke out of his dismay. He, he, he was a crying prophet. He couldn't stop crying. In fact, one scripture he says, oh, that my head was a fountain of water that I might cry on behalf of Jerusalem. And then there was this guy named Ezekiel. And he was accustomed to fantasies and hallucinations. He would see things like wheels in the middle of wheels. Uh, he would see these strange visions that pointed to the omnipresence and the power of God. They were called by the government, called by people in power, a nuisance, cranks, liberals. <laughs> Anarchists. Troublemakers, outsiders, but the Bible calls them prophets, near beings, those who speak truth. And they were often hostile and abrasive. They knew how to curse. My professor of pneumatology at Duke says one of the problems in in, in contemporary churches that we have turned cursing over to the rappers when it was never supposed to be their duty. <laughs> I'm not talking about mere profanity, but we've turned cursing over to the rappers when actually the only ones that have authority to curse are God's prophets because they know what is damned and what is blessed. <laughs> they know the difference between God's way in the world's way. And, and, and the people like Ezekiel and Jeremiah, their speeches were unwelcome. But they had to be strong. They, they had to use tough metaphors. It was not hatred, it was love because they could see what no one else could see. And this is the significance of the prophet and the prophetic church and the prophetic ministry. This must be the goal of any seminary that is trying to create prophets for this generation. Not just to teach people how to read and how to do research and how to put the footnote, but you must teach them how to see what the nation doesn't want to look at. That's why their words, though harsh and abrasive, we preserve them. And that's why when we really want to hear truth, we run to the prophets because they could see the death that was coming and they knew it didn't have to be that way. Ezekiel, the one who hallucinated. Now, he, not the prophet, he was not against technology. He knew sometimes you need technology. He wasn't against sometimes the nation being strong because he was, he was clear that there's some interesting people in the world. And sometimes you need a little security. But like Walter Wink knew, that when the powers are committed to oppression and violence, and when the power undermines security and peace, and when the powers dismiss nonviolence in favor of violence, somebody must name the power. And somebody must seek the redemption of the powers. And Ezekiel knew by the Spirit that you cannot have peace if you lie. We can't as individuals, we can't as a nation. You cannot have well-being if you do not speak truth to one another and that all the weapon systems in the world cannot save us from this, the worst place to live in and that is a state of denial and self-deception. But now here's the kick. Y'all, make sure I can get out the back door. <laughs> if you read the text, Ezekiel did not blame the king. He did not blame the tea party. He did not blame the government. He did not blame the Koch brothers' money. He did not blame the military for the, the terrible death that was coming upon Jerusalem. He blamed those who were commissioned to keep the moral movement alive because they were selling their gift to the chaplaincy of the state rather than maintaining the role of being critics of the state. I didn't think I'd get too many applause. 
in this text, Ezekiel does not blame the oppressor for being an oppressor. He says that's what oppressors do. The problem, he says, is the priest and the religionists are not doing their job. The religious community, the clergy, the prophet. In fact, in the 13th division of Ezekiel, he says, my hands, speaking for God, will be against the prophets who see delusive visions and give lying messages. Ezekiel blamed the religious community because that, that community is responsible for standing in the gap and engaging in the necessary ministry of prophetic pastoral care for the nation. It doesn't say you stand in the gap and if they don't change in a week, you leave the gap. It doesn't say you stand in the gap and then when you can get a better church that doesn't require you to stand on behalf of poor people, you get that. Ezekiel says to be called by God is to stand in the gap whether the society listens to you or not. Remember the first chapter of Ezekiel? He says, look, Ezekiel, when God, when, when it's, it's funny because when Ezekiel sees God, he has a Pentecostal falling out. He just falls out, boom, and God says, get up! I can't use you down there in the middle of the floor. Get up here! And you got to understand, I have that. I'm a Pentecostal. I understand there are times you'll be slain in the spirit, but there are times that being slain in the spirit is nothing but a cop out for not standing up when you need to be standing up. Yeah. Oh, don't mess with me. Don't mess, don't mess. He said, get up, boy. He said, now I want you to go and sit among the people for seven days. I want you to understand the pain of those who are poor and those who are hurting and those who have been oppressed because you cannot be just some, 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 some person who just makes a job out of speaking for people because you read a real couple of statistics but you really don't love the people because you'll go wherever the grant goes. No, 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 no. I need you to go sit among the people so that the people's pain becomes your pain and you have to do it because you don't know any other way to live and please God if you're not standing for what's right. Then he said, now after you sat among the people, I need you to go speak, but understand this, I'm telling you that your ministry in the eyes of people will be a failure. You will not change them at first. For I am assigning you to a nation that is full of stiff-necked people. And they love their power more than they love people. But you stand in that gap because at least they will know there hath been a prophet among them. In fact, one writer says it like this. Can I just take my time a little bit? One writer says it like this, the only time prophets arose in the Bible is when the priests and kings weren't doing their jobs. And the way of the nation was having more sway than the truth of God. And here the prophets and priests had failed. Instead of telling the truth, they distorted it. And they were telling the people, your walls will protect you. But the Bible says, they were helping the people put up walls with untempered mortar, with cement that was not properly mixed that could be easily torn down. <laughs> and that the walls, instead of bringing security, would actually end up falling on the nation and bringing the nation down. <laughs> One commentator says, this text in Ezekiel is like today when people call war peace. <laughs> That's a lie. Or we call self-interest generosity. Or we call greed opportunity. <laughs> we call brutality national interests. And we call exploitation the free market. We just lie. And such lies, says Ezekiel, will lead to death. Now, that's the scene in Jerusalem. And you can't apply a text until you understand its original context. 
But now knowing that context, I would suggest in our world today, thousands of years after Ezekiel, his analysis still have contemporary application. I wonder if Ezekiel preached this message, Ezekiel 22, on an, doing an Old Testament moral Monday, <laughs> standing before the seats of power. Because my friends, we still be a walls, thinking we're protecting ourselves. You know, walls of the city. You've got walls, I saw some coming here. Barriers that could disconnect one part of the city from the other. Walls, Wall Street. As long as Wall Street is all right, everybody else is all right. But didn't we find out in the Bush area that that no longer holds true? Walls of finance, walls of defense, walls of security and privilege, walls that exclude and certain walls that include walls of policy. Some people even trying to keep walls in the church. They're trying to suggest in a church where Jesus said, whosoever will let him come, that only some folk can come in their church. That's a wall. We build walls to create, and the world needs to hear this, a distance between the haves and the have not. America right now is committing one of the greatest sins, being the wealthiest and the poorest nation, both at the same time. When politicians can run for office and say, elect me. You ever thought about what the Tea Party whole agenda is once you break it down? I mean, get, I mean you know, I, I can be deep if necessary, you know, <laughs> you know, and do you a contextual political analysis of the current situation inside of contemporary politics according to the left and the right analysis. I mean, I could do that, <laughs> but let's just break it down. Here's their whole agenda. And, and people are buying it. And Ezekiel would say people are buying it not because the people are crazy, but because the prophets aren't standing up. Here's their whole agenda. Elect me, and this is how I will lead you to a greater America. Elect me, I will deny public education. I will deny teachers that do. I'll deny health care to the sick and the poorest. I'll deny living wages. I'll deny minimum wages, I'll deny LGBT rights, I'll deny women's rights, I'll deny labor rights, I'll deny environmental justice, I'll deny the right to vote, uh, I'll call the president everything but a child of God, even there's nothing wrong with criticizing him when he's wrong, but I'll criticize him when he's right. <laughs> In fact, I'll talk about his wife, I'll talk about her arms when she doesn't wear a certain kind of dress, I'll talk about her hips, I'll talk about her even when she attempts to get children to eat their vegetables. But I'll agree with him with war. In fact, I'll go in the front page of the U.S. News like Boehner did yesterday and said we need more troops on the ground, but I'll never agree with him that we need more health care for the sick and more immigrant rights for the immigrant and more help for the poor. I'll never do that. And then, and, 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 and if you elect me, I'll stir up all of this racial division and class division and homophobia, and I'll do all of that. Just elect me, because we're going to get to a better America if you elect me, because after I do all of that, I'll make sure you can get a gun easier than you can vote. And when you hear that kind of language receiving receptivity and people getting elected running on that, that's a wall of ignorance and a wall of indifference that produces gaps of inequality. When you allow the dumping of toxic chemicals in the rivers and on the land, but you ensure that those chemicals are dumped where mostly poor people live and minority people live. Like recently in North Carolina, this company called Duke Energy had the worst, third worst coal ash spill in the history of the nation. And now they are putting out information saying coal ash is not toxic. Of course, it's not in the executive's backyard. It's not in the governor's backyard who used to work for them. So to break down the wall to stand in the gap, we've now said, well, if the coal ash is not toxic, then you go down to the river with your ash and get some ash and <laughs> Put your ash in a cup and add some milk and some sugar 
and some ice and put your ash in a bullet and stir it up, make you a smoothie and drink your ash. I'm just saying. When policies are passed to say we ought to have pity on billionaires and bail them out, but have contempt for the poor and actually get on TV like Representative Ryan did and say that people on, in poverty are, are laying in a hammock as though poverty is some kind of glorified vacation. That's a wall of indifference and insanity that creates more economic isolation. Uh, when many want to talk about homosexuality as being wrong, but then say nothing about the illicit intercourse and relationship between the United Supreme Court and big money that keeps birthing the abnormal and illegitimate offspring of injustice and a malformed de democracy. Come on. When you got folk that want to claim that they have some, they are conservative Christians. I'm a conservative Christian. I knew y'all weren't going to say amen. That's all right. <laughs> See, because we sometimes even buy into this language. We need to start debating this. How do you get to call yourself a conservative? Watch this. Let me see. I'm a country boy, but let me see. Now, conserve means to hold on to the essence of. Right? It means to preserve the essence of. So you call yourself a conservative Christian. Now, you claim that with that particular philosophy, the only issues important in the public square is where you stand on homosexuality, abortion, prayer in the school, and raising taxes. <clears throat> Let's see now, you're conservative. There is no scripture in the Bible about abortion, per se. And, 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 and the strangeness of your position is you claim you're for life inside the womb, but then you kill people once they get here. So that, that annihilates that whole argument. Let's just look at that. So let's, let's deal with that. Uh, uh, you know, and, and, and you know, I'm not pro-abortion, but I, 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 if, I, if I suggest to someone to have the child, I'm willing to adopt the child and take the child in and raise the child. You see what I'm saying? That's a whole different ball. Wait, now, now, now. Secondly, you, you say prayer in the school, but there's no scripture in the Bible about prayer in the school. A whole lot of scripture in the Bible about prayer in your house, prayer in your heart, prayer in your secret closet, prayer in the lion's den, prayer, prayer on top of the mountain, but there's no, about prayer in the school. Now, you claim homosexuality is such a problem. There's only about mm, five scriptures, if that many, that speak to the issue. Uh, four of them you misinterpret, and not one of them trumps this scripture. You must love your neighbor as yourself. Not your neighbor that's straight, not your neighbor that's gay. So now what do you have left? Raising taxes, and now you know that it ain't there's not one biblical scripture that suggests that you ought to raise taxes on poor people or charge usury and interest. But on the other hand, but you are conservative. On the other hand, there are 2,500 scriptures in the Bible that speak to the issue of how you treat the poor, how you treat women, how you treat children, how you treat the least of these, how you treat the sick, how you treat immigrants, even how you treat your enemy. Now, how can you be a conservative if you dismiss 2,500 scary and build your whole theology on issues that most of them don't even have a scriptural background and the ones that you do have been trumped by the greater scripture, love thy neighbor as thyself. Y'all didn't know y'all were conservative, did you? You've been thinking you were liberal all the while. So in reality, I'm a conservative because I want to conserve love and justice and mercy and compassion. And I wonder, do I have a few born again conservatives in the house to now that might just be feeling the spirit? You don't have to be ashamed of who you are. That, that whole line to say this is conservative and this is, is nothing but a wall. Huh? Systemic racism is a wall, classism is a wall, sexism is a wall. And whenever in our community we try to hide from one another, if I was being pastor tonight, I would even say, when you come into church and you have to stand in the back and look and see who you're going to sit beside because you just can't sit beside somebody else 
that's a wall too. And it's hard to practice external justice when you can't practice internal justice. And in the language of Ezekiel, these walls that create gaps have a name. It's an old name. It's a name, Patricia, I learned from my grandmother. And she never went to Auburn or Union or Princeton or Duke. But she was right. Sin. Oh, I knew y'all wasn't going to amen that in New York, but that's what it is. And, the great, and sin, the greatest sin in the Bible, is not your personal failing, because everybody's got some of those. That's between you, your God, and your personal. But the greatest sin in the Bible is when you use public power to create public harm on God's people who have been made in the image of God. That's sin. When you use the systems of this world to create inhumanity against other human, human beings, that's sin. And we liberals and progressives need to start calling sin, sin. And we need to be bold enough to say it doesn't matter who the governor is. It doesn't matter who the legislature is. It doesn't matter who the president is. It doesn't matter what your party is. When you use public power to produce harm in the lives of people, it's sin. In fact, in fact, Ezekiel says, get this on tape. Ezekiel says it's animalistic. He says, when you use power to hurt people, you have to move beyond um, anthropomorphic uh, descriptions of people and move to the animal kingdom. When people will use power to hurt the women and children and the sick, he says, you have to get out of the human language and start describing their actions, maybe not them, but their actions reflect roaring lions who are on the prowl. They reflect rabies infected wolves. That's what it says. And so this text says, number one, somebody must with moral authority stand in the gap and speak the inconvenient truth. March 18, 1968, 16 days before Dr. King was killed, he preached a sermon that you ought to read. Most folk read, I have a dream, maybe I've been to the mountaintop, but Doc had more to say than that. In fact, tell all my good friends in the movement, um, the 99, you know that, the 99, what was that movement? I, 99, Occupy. Wall Street and talking about the 99% that Dr. King preached about that in one of his first sermons at Dexter in a sermon called Paul's Letter to American Christians. And he talked about how capitalism was on the side of the 1% and leaving in its wake the 99%. March 18th, 1968, they were saying Dr. King was a failure, Patricia. They were saying it was over. They had infiltrated the march. They had said nonviolence was coming to an end. He was being fought by preachers. He was being fought by young people. He was being fought by the media. He was being fought by J. Edgar Hoover. And he stands up in front of 17,000 people to call them to stand in the gap. And this is what he uses to do his socio-political analysis. He, he, said, he says, let me tell you why we're marching with these sanitation workers. You know, Jesus reminded us in a parable one day that a man went to hell because he didn't see the poor. That man was named Dives, and the man at the gate was named Lazarus, and Dives wouldn't even let the man eat the crumbs that fell down for the dogs. Then Dr. King says, now notice the text. There's nothing in that parable that says Dives went to hell because he was rich. Dives went to hell because he maximized the minimum and minimized the maximum. Dives went to hell because he wanted to be a conscientious objector in the war against poverty. 
And then Dr. King said this, and you probably, some, many of you probably never heard it. He says, and I come here to say tonight that America too is going to hell if we don't use her wealth, if America does not use her vast resources of wealth to end poverty, to make it possible for all of God's children to have their basic necessities of life, she too will go to hell. Now that's heavy language. But that's Dr. King standing in the gap. I'm, I might be the only one out here, but I'm not going to turn to nonviolence. I'm not going to stop speaking the truth. I'm not going to give up hope, but I'm going to tell it like it T.I. is. And then he says, he says, I can hear historians in the future saying, to, didn't we build gigantic buildings to kiss the sky? Through our spaceships, didn't we carve highways in the stratosphere? With our airplanes, didn't we draw distance, place, and time and change? With our submarines like the one I just saw coming here, didn't we penetrate the oceanic death? And Dr. King said, yes, the historians will say that, but then I will hear the God of the universe say, even though you've done all of that, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. The sons and daughters that were in need of economic security, you did not provide it for them. And then he said, this may well be the indictment on America. And this is why right here in Memphis, we must stand if there's any possibility of saving the soul of the nation. And today, we somebody must still stand in the gap and speak this kind of truth. If we want to be a great nation, if we want to be a strong nation, we must have a moral focus, not merely a Democratic versus Republican, a liberal versus conservative, but a moral focus of what government ought to be. We ought to pull from our deepest moral traditions in our Constitution and our deepest moral traditions in our faith tradition, and it's time for people of faith to come out of the sanctuary and preach in the public square. I want you to know, this is how I dress at the legislature. It's time for us to put on our vestments, not just in here, but like Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah, to put on our vestments and go out there and declare we're standing in the gap and we're going to speak an inconvenient truth. A truth that says we can have pro-labor, anti-poverty policies that create economic sustainability by fighting for employment and living wages and the alleviation of disparate unemployment and a green economy and labor rights and affordable housing and tar targeted empowerment zones and community banks, strong safety net services for the poor, fair policies for immigrants, infrastructure development and fair tax reform. Somebody needs to stand in the gap and say that. We can have educational equality and ensure every child receives a high quality, well-funded, constitutional, diverse public education with access to community college and, and universities. We can have health care for all by beginning with ensuring access to the Affordable Care Act, but then by going greater than that and just making sure everybody has universal health care. We can protect Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security, and we must have environmental protection because I don't care if the Hubble telescope has seen 16 more places that look like Earth. Far as I know, this is it. This is the only one we have. We must stand in the gap and say this country cannot be who she claims to be until we have fairness in the criminal justice system by addressing the continuing inequalities in that system that impact black people, brown people, and poor white people. Somebody must stand in the gap and say we not only must protect voting rights, we must expand voting rights because if you can be drafted at 18, you ought to be automatically registered at 18 in that same democracy. But not only should we protect and expand voting rights, we should protect and expand women's rights and LGBTQ rights and immigrants' rights and we should demand that America will never forfeit on its promise of equal protection under the law for every citizen. We must stand in the gap. We must leave the sanctuary 
In fact, begin in the sanctuary and make sure the people in the sanctuary understand that preaching in the public square is not a sideshow of the church. It is in fact the calling of the church because why would you keep all this truth up in here? Why would you keep all this truth it's inside the four walls of a sanctuary? I heard the, the rabbi when he said the call of Yom Kippur is to cry loud and spare not and become repairers of the breach. We must have a focus, a moral focus, not on Democrat and Republican. That's too weak. It's too minimal. It's, the language is too puny for the desperateness in the souls of America right now. We need a language, a moral language that reclaims the language of love and liberty and life and justice and the common good and says that anything less than language and actions that follow that language is a weak, anemic, hellish, brutal form of pretentious democracy. And then secondly, somebody must expose the weakness produced in our society when political power is used to hurt and harm rather than heal and help. Somebody, you, as Bishop Tutu once said when I was sitting in seminary, who will join God in his high voice? <laughs> You know, and I thought he was talking to me. He was in Duke Chapel, and I was like, why is he talking to me? I'm just a seminarian. <laughs> but there must be somebody who will stand up and say to leaders, you're losing your humanity. You're allowing the power to transform you into wolves and lions and not servants. There must be moral voices, not because of a grant. Maybe the grants will come if you stand long enough, but you shouldn't wait on the grant to stand. Moral voices that say the power, you're wrong. You're just wrong. Somebody say wrong. Think about when the last time you said that. You need to learn how to say that word. You're just wrong. You're wrong when you govern on behalf of the powerful and step on the poor. You're wrong when you cater to the wealthy and disregard the weak. You're wrong when you seek to take us backwards into more racial and social division rather than forward into unity and life. Doesn't matter who your party is. Doesn't matter if you my mama. You're wrong. Anytime Otto Swammer at MIT, and MIT is not known for being a great place of theological discourse. <clears throat> but anytime MIT, it, M I, Otto Swam, an economist at MIT says, the only way he can explain what's going on in America right now in terms of economics is to say, we have a blind spot in America's economic theory and it's called conscience. Conscience. Now this is, this is MIT. You can't let MIT be clearer than a seminary. You can't let MIT out prophesy the church. He's saying this in public. He says, every day we commit attention violence against the poor because that we have spent years removing just the word from the dialogue. You know, Bonner, uh, I mean, Ryan, I said, says the poor are on a glorified vacation. But even President Obama has, gotten, has struggled with this. And that's why even good presidents, good people, need prophetic voices around them because this system will corrupt you. And so his advisor said, don't, don't say poor, say those working to get into the middle class. No, some people are poor. They are not working to get into the middle class. They are trying to survive every day on a minimum wage that is, that is, that is equated to a wage in 1968. When a political economist at the University of Maryland says, what we're really beginning to experience is a process of slow decay punctuated by a reoccurring economic crisis, one in which reforms achieve sporadic gains, but the long-term trends of growing inequality, economic dislocation, failing democratic accountability, deepening poverty, ecological degradation, greater invasions of liberty, and growing imprisonment, especially among our minorities, continually, continues to slowly and quietly challenge the belief in the capacities and the moral integrity of the overall system and its governing elite. In other words, we just messed up. 
and we're all off center morally. And when a professor of economics can say that, then the church cannot be even more strong in our critique. It's wrong. Somebody say, try that word one more time. Say it's wrong. You know, just because you liberal and love folk don't mean some stuff is not wrong. Huh? Yeah. That, the, word, the definition of liberal doesn't mean everything goes. I know it because I, I, I bet you, I bet you what, if somebody slapped one of you liberals in here, you, you would show them that you're wrong. <laughs> one way or the other. I tell folk all the time I get death threats and I say, I'm fine, but my cane isn't saved. <laughs> you got it's wrong. It's wrong. Say it's wrong one more time. Wrong. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how much coke you have sniffed, K-O-C-H. It doesn't matter how many votes you have. It doesn't matter what your supermajority is. It doesn't matter how much spike tea has gotten you drunk. Somebody must expose the gaps in our walls and the weaknesses produced in society when political power is used to trample on the common good. And that's your calling. Is there one who will stand in the gap? Now, as I close, you got to know something, though. Truth telling is dangerous. It's not comfortable and it's costly. For Ezekiel, it caused him to have constant hallucinations and visions. He couldn't sleep at night because of the desperation. In fact, it cost him time with his family. In fact, the, the Lord tells Ezekiel, the nation is in such trouble. Your wife is going to die. When she does, you get four hours to bury her. You got to have her buried by 12 o'clock noon. And by 12.05, you better be back preaching. And that in itself will be a prophetic sign. Don't sign up to be God's one and then check your calendar for the next five years. Don't sign up to be God's one and then say, but, but, but I'll do it next Tuesday. Truth telling is dangerous. You'll be considered a crank by some of the folk you thought were with you. Telling the truth and taking on the forces that would hurt children and prey on the weak and widen the gap between the haves and the have not cannot be a hobby. It can't be a fad. It must be become a, 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 a way of life. Somebody just asked me, well, what is the moral Monday movement going to do after the election? I said, what we were doing before the election. We don't, our movement is not determined by one election. Do you know when Dr. King stood up and and preach one of the most subversive things you can ever say in America, I have a dream. That's a subversive language, particularly when you're saying that in the face of the nightmares of racism and the nightmares of injustice. When you dare, not with missiles, not with guns, to stand tall and look right at the creator of the nightmare and say, yes, it's true, you are producing a nightmare, but I will not accept that as final reality, I have a dream. That'll get you killed. In fact, it'll get four girls in a Birmingham church 15 days after you said that kill. When you stand in the gap, it may get worse before it get better. The politicians may not change. The election may not, you may not be able to elect a Messiah candidate that's gonna fix everything. That can't be your hope. Your hope has gotta be standing in the gap and, and working until you not so much change who is elected, but change the context in which they are elected. You see, and if that happens, you might mess around and get a Chief Justice Warren who was bad on the issue of Chinese immigration and everybody thought he was just prejudiced and racist and, and would never be a Chief Justice presiding over Brown versus Board of Education. But when the context changed, when the consciousness shifted, it, it disallowed people to do what maybe they had been appointed to do. Or you may get a former segregationist like Lyndon Baines Johnson, who never planned to sign the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. But when the prophets stand in the gap, and when prophetic people stand in the gap and shift the context, 
then somebody elected to do one thing might end up having to do another, which is why you got to walk by faith and not by sight. And you got to see this down the long road. You got to see how things will move. You might get beat up on the first attempt to march across the Edmunds Pettus Bridge. But that'll give the TV and the world the pictures they need in order to show them all around the world. And then somebody way over in Russia might call the president and say, how can y'all criticize communism when I just saw what's happening? And then the president says, send the troops down there to protect them because we can't have Russia having a higher moral authority than us. But none of that will happen until you're willing to stand in the gap. It can't be a matter of Political party has got to be a matter of heart and soul. Touch your neighbor and say, if you can do anything other than stand for justice, you probably don't want to stand. My grandma said, son, if you're going to preach, make sure it ain't nothing else you can do. She said, make sure you don't have any options because if you truly preach, you're going to be made to consider those options sometimes. So you need to make up in your mind, you've been called, humbly so, but you've been called to do this. Reverend Reeb, who was killed a year later, said this at Souls, All Souls Church. He said, if we're gonna be able to meet the needs right now, we're gonna have to really take upon ourselves a continuing and disciplined effort uh, with no real hope that in our lifetime we are ever going to be able to take a vacation from the struggle for justice. Let all who live in freedom, won by the sacrifice of others, be untiring in the task begun. And that's why Ezekiel warned, lying is death. Allowing the nation or the state or the city to lie to itself is a form of death. And some would say, well, why would you come to New York and preach an almost depressing text? But see, to somebody that would say that to me, I would say, you don't understand prophetic exegesis. This is not a, a depressing text. It's a truthful text. And tr only truth sets you free. You can't go to get to hope without going through hell. <laughs> Y'all don't hear what I'm saying? Oh, y y y I'm, are there any Christians in here or at least claim to be Christian go to church? <laughs> I mean, yeah. You understand that you can't get to resurrection without going through Calvary. I wish I had a witness here. The Bible says that when, when the anointing came down on Jesus and said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, then the same spirit drove him in the wilderness. Watch the text. Help me, New Testament scholars. When he went in the wilderness, he was driven by the spirit. When he came out of the wilderness, he was in the power of the spirit. You can't get the power without going through the wilderness. So, so my brother, there's hope. In it. Here, here's the hope. Here's the hope. Here's the hope. I look for somebody that would stand in the gap and I could find no one, not one, that would cause me to save the city. Y'all hear the hope in that? Sounds terrible, doesn't it? But flip that thing over, flip it over. The flip side is God only needs one. Y'all didn't hear that. Look at the text. He says, I look for one. If I could just find one, then I would not destroy the city. So what if God could find two, like two seminarians that used to be in Marl Monday, one ebony and one ivory? What if God could find two seminaries like Auburn and Union that would commit to raise profits for the 21st century? What if God, if God could save the nation because one would stand in the gap? What would happen? And, and let me tell you as I close, that's all the Marl Monday movement is. People get down to me, explain it, explain it, explain it. Tell me all that. Can't really do that. I, I can tell you pieces. I can tell you. I don't know all that happened myself. Didn't plan to do but one. 
you know how I would, we, we plan to give voice to the issue. You know, we think if we just do one rally, we've given voice. We didn't plan for 79 straight moral Mondays, but the Lord did. Uh, the moral Monday movement, if I would use this text to examine it, is that simply we are performing Ezekiel's pastoral care to the state. <laughs> That's all we're doing. Uh, we're being the prophets of pastoral care to a sick state and some sick politician that can be redeemed, but they will never be redeemed unless somebody stands in the gap and loves them enough to speak the truth. We are not partisan. We, we, we've just decided to be God's one movement in North Carolina. We are engaged in truth telling. We're saying to the power structure in a state where there are 1.6 million poor people and lingering structures of systemic racism and discrimination and powerful politicians who put their hands on the Bible and, 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 and swear to uphold the Constitution but then choose to follow whoever paid them and don't know what's in the Bible or in the Constitution. We have a problem. Houston, 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 we have a problem when they claim that the answer to every problem is tax cut how do you fix teachers tax cut how do you help the sick tax cut how do you, how do you well i'm a i'm a country boy and i know better than that how do you how does a pig become a hog you got to feed it how does a, ch a chicken becomes a, ch a hen you got to feed it how do poor people get better you got to provide some safety net how do people have more money you got to feed them and give them living wages i know better than that but we got these folk that think that they lie to themselves of every problem and then the other lie why, why are you against affordable care act freedom what do you mean because freedom is the first principle of america no it's not that's not even the first principle of our constitution that's not the first the constitution says in order to form a more perfect union establish justice that's the first principle huh domestic tranquility promoting the general welfare ask your neighbor say neighbor how did we Christians and people of faith ever let them get away with calling welfare a bad word when it's in the preamble of the Constitution? We slipped. And so we stood in the gap on April 29th, 17 of us. They arrested us. Seven preachers, 10 others, one lady with cerebral palsy. They took a walker from her, brought 25 officers out, put her hand, thought they were doing something, being bad. The next Monday, 34 came, and we didn't text them. <laughs> Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. You keep asking me, how did you get, I don't know. All I know is God said, can I find one? And we stood in the gap. And when we stood in the gap, somebody saw us standing in the gap, said, well, maybe I'll try it. And then the next Sunday, Monday, 68. Then we had to sit down and figure out the movement because we hadn't planned but one. We had to give it a name. <laughs> we had to start getting some food together. And by the end of the summer, 900 and over 45, 60 some people had come and 25,000 people had come and preachers and rabbis and Muslims and Hindus and Baha'is and even people that don't believe had come standing arm in arm, standing in the gap. When we started, they said we were morons and outsiders. But now, the governor was at 50% when we started. Now he's at 30% and falling. When we started, the legislature was at 40% in the poll, and now they're 17% and falling. When we started, the majority of North Carolinians didn't believe in Medicaid expansion, didn't believe in expanding health care, I mean, uh, unemployment, and they didn't believe you ought to raise taxes to pay teachers and support public education. But after 79 straight weeks of Moral Monday and conscious education standing in the gap, and when 80 to 100,000 people came in the dead of winter on the second weekend in February to stand in the gap, now every issue that was under 50% is polling over 50%. All I'm telling you is somebody must stand in the gap because God's got a promise. 
God says that if somebody will stand in the gap, I'll save the nation. And somebody's got to stand there against the polls and against the editorials and against the death threats and say there is a better way. We can have living wages. We can educate our children. We can reject hate and division and mean attempts to write people out of their constitutional protections and out of their own humanity. We can, we can, and somebody's got to stand there. Not just to expose the wrong because a movement that's just rooted in what you're against is not standing in the gap. If you're gonna stand in the gap, have something to close it. Have an agenda besides, I just hate the Tea Party. I just hate the Koch brothers. Come together around an agenda that puts bridges over the gaps. That, 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 that tears down the walls of divisions and opens up the walls until everybody can be contained within the protection of our democracy and of our society. The flip side of exposing the lies and hurting and harm is that by exposing the lies, we reveal the truth. And so one writer asked this question, what would happen if all of us in the church and in the faith community as moral agents decided to undertake truth telling about the fabric of human caring authorized by God. What if we chose to break free from all the loyalties we have given our loyalties to and our own fears about standing up? What if we decided to take the church out of the posture of simply being a Sunday morning experience and started having moral Mondays like Jesus did the first Monday of Holy Week when he turned over the tables in the temple. You know that was the first Mar Monday. Hmm? What if we began, all of us, to just engage in acts of risky generosity? Well, I want to try it. Because my God says, if I could just find one, hmm? what if we all got together? What a day of justice it would be. So I want to ask you to try to ask God to bless you with that Franciscan benediction. Lord, bless me with discomfort at easy answers and half truths and superficial relationships so that I may live deep within my, your heart. Lord, bless me with anger at injustice and oppression and exploitation of people so that I may work for justice, freedom, and peace. Lord, bless me with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, hunger, and war so that I may reach out your hand, God, to comfort them and turn their joy, their pain into joy. And Lord, bless me with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference and I can make a difference in this difficult world. Bless me with enough foolishness of faith to believe that what others say can't be done, can, can be done. Justice and kindness can be brought to all your children. Now God, through Ezekiel, once again is saying to us tonight, and to all you that might hear this by video, I'm looking for a man. I'm looking for a woman. I don't care if they're gay or straight. I don't care if they're rich or poor. I don't care if they're black or white. I'm looking for them. I don't care, I don't care whether you're rural or urban. And there's no prerequisite. He didn't say, I'm looking for a seminary professor. I'm looking for the best trained theologian. I'm looking for a Nobel Peace Prize Lord, a great humanitarian. I'm looking. I'm looking. I'm looking, I'm looking for a person, a person, not, not an exceptional person, just common person, somebody that'll stand in the gap and speak, somebody who will stand on the promises of God, Christ my savior, somebody that will stand in the dreams of God over against the nightmarish realities of our world. 
And I just want to tell you like I would at home as a country preacher, when we do what God supposed, tells us to do, God will show up. Oh, for me, this faith is not some academic experience. God will show up. God will bless our efforts. God always has, and God always will. Faith is what you believe about God, but works is what you do because of what you believe about God. Faith without works is dead, but faith with works is dynamic, and it'll change your destiny. Oh, I know it because I am a conservative biblicist, so I know the book. Ezekiel found out that if you just stand in the gap and speak God's truth long enough, the folk might be stiff-necked, but after a while, God will take you down to a valley of dry bones, and he'll say, that's my people down there. And God will ask you, can those bones live? And if you're like Ezekiel, you'll say, Lord, I don't know. And then you'll say, but God, what do you want me to do? And God will say, speak to the bones. And if you speak, the bones will start standing up. And the, as the old folks said, the toe bone will connect to the foot bone. And the foot bone will connect to the ankle bone. And, but it won't be about bones. It'll be about people. And when you've done your part, then God will say, step back. Now let me blow on those bones and fill them with your, my spirit. Because now there's an army rising. Because you stood in the gap. I'm here to tell you, Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass and white abolitionists, they found out that when you stand in the gap, God will show up and you can defeat slavery. Thurgood Marshall, white and black Jews and lawyers found out when you stand in the gap, you can take an all white Supreme Court with one former Ku Klux Klan member and get them to vote nine to zero to overturn separate but equal. Sojourner Truth and Elizabeth Canton Staten showed us if you stand in the gap, you can overcome the chauvinism of America and you can force them to begin to treat women right. M Martin King, the NAACP, and unions showed us that if you stand in the gap, you can resist Jim Crow and you can get a Civil Rights Act passed, a Voting Rights Act passed, when all of the pundits say there's no way it's going to happen. Nelson Mandela proved it, that when a few black folk and white folk will stand in the gap as freedom fighters you can bring apartheid down and lift justice up. I know what history said but not only that when I go to the Bible, will somebody go to the Bible with me? When Moses stood in the gap huh, and stretched out his rod then God opened the Red Sea and the people went over when Esther and her uncle Mordecai stood in the gap then they were able to stop the plot and destruction against the, the, the Israeli people. When David got his little rock, his little slingshot, and stood in the gap on the battlefield, then Goliath fell. And the next morning in the Jerusalem time, it read, the bigger they come, the harder they fall. Hey, God, I feel something in here now. If I was down south, I would say when Shadrach, Meshach, and that bad Negro stood in the gap, God showed up, stood in the fire with them, and calmed it right on down. When the disciples stood in the gap in an upper room, then God brought his spirit in the room. And when they came out, they weren't scared of Pilate. They weren't scared of Herod. They weren't scared of Caesar. All they feared was God. And when my Jesus stood in the gap on a hill called Calvary, oh, he stood in the gap. And the old folks said he died until death died. He died until the earth shook like a rabbit in the middle of the day. He died until the earth got as dark as midnight around about noonday. And they tell me that the Pharisees had a party, that the Sadducees started shouting, and that Satan thought it was all over. But he stood in the gap. Didn't somebody hear him say, if I stand in the gap, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men under me. And in early Sunday morning, God stood him up one more time with all power in his hand. Touch your neighbor but say, neighbor, you better learn how to stand in the gap. And let me tell my own testimony as I go to my seat. Y'all don't know I came in here on a walker. But what you don't know about my story is that in 2000 and, and 1993, I had a disease come over my body. And they said I'd never walk again. They, they got my room ready for me in the nursing home. I was 30 years old, 30. And everything I had touched up to 30 turned to gold. I used to lift four 
2,500 pounds with these thighs here on the bench, on the leg press. But all that was over in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Lord, have mercy. And a lady came into my room. Can't find her now. So I just imagined because she was amputated and there were no amputees on my floor. I was depressed and in the middle of the night, think I had a hallucination. <clears throat> think I had one of those strange Ezekiel vision because I haven't been able to find the lady. But let me tell you what she said. She said, boy, you better do what the Lord tells you and you better stand. Say, God's going to fix it if you come up out of this depression. Now, you're going to be crippled, but you stand. You're going to be crippled. You're going to have a limp, but you stand because God's got work for you. And the more you stand for justice, the stronger your body is going to get. At first, I told her, get out of my room because I don't want to hear all that because I don't feel like hearing that. But she said, well, you can't run. <laughs> Because you can't walk. So she put her hands on me and prayed for me. Went out the room next morning and something got over me. Felt like a new person. Called my doctor in, said, I think I'm ready to do my therapy. Please go get the woman that came in my room. He said, what woman? I said, well, she's a double amputee. He said, son, no amputees on this floor. I said, okay, Lord, thank you for sending me an amputated angel. Okay, go get the therapist. Tell the therapist I'm ready to do. Therapist went to work. Long story short, I came out of the hospital on a walker and in a wheelchair. But then there was an issue in our city about resegregation of schools. And I went to the meeting and pushed myself up out of that wheelchair and stood with that walker and stood in the gap. Next thing I know, 800 other folk were standing in the gap. I decided every time somebody wanted to be baptized, I was going to go in the pool and somehow stand in the gap. I promised God I'd preach and every time I preached while I was standing preaching, no pain. Soon as I finished pain all through my body. I don't know what was going on. All I know is the more I stood for what was right the stronger my body got and I'm here to tell you after the 1993 I couldn't walk. They didn't know what was going to happen. What year is it? 2014 look here. Y'all you better help me. All I know is if you stand, God will take care of you. All I know is if you'll stand in the gap, God will make a way out of no way. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, is there anybody that will trust God and stand in the gap? If you make that decision tonight, I've got to, can I preach like I would at home? I've got a word for you. What do you do when you've done all you can and it seems like never enough? And what do you say when your friends turn away and you're all alone? Tell me what do you give when you've given your all and it seems like you can't make it through? Well, you just stand. When there's nothing less to do, you just stand. Watch the Lord see you through. Don't dare give up. Through the storm, stand. Through the rain, stand. Through the hurt, stand. Auburn Seminary, Union Seminary, don't you bow. Don't you bend. Don't you give up. Don't you give in. Hold on. Just be strong. God will step in and it won't be long. Just stand, 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 stand. Hallelujah.